You are watching an episode in our Landlording A to Z series, where we walk you through the steps, skills, and challenges involved with residential rental real estate investing. We share our expert advice, including the tips, tricks, and strategies we've learned over years of managing rental property. Please subscribe to our channel to get notified each time a new episode comes out, and please like and share our content with people you know who might be interested. Thanks for watching. Hey there, everyone. Thanks for joining us. This is Landlord Gurus, uh, Landlording A to Z. We are in episode five, setting tenant selection criteria. So you have you've gotten your place ready to rent, and now here is where you decide how you're going to choose your tenants. So you're going to want to be intentional and specific about what characteristics you require. And that way it'll help ensure that you end up with reliable long-term tenants, which is kind of what we're after here. Deciding what criteria tenants must meet uh, makes it easy to decide quickly whether or not to accept or deny an applicant. It also ensures fairness when you're selecting tenants. So you set your criteria, you have your kind of list of things that you are looking for, or things that might disqualify a person, and you have that and you make that the same and you apply that equally for everyone. So we'll get into it a little bit more, but right now I'm just going to remind everyone to like and subscribe these videos and share it. We're doing our, as I said, our A to Z. So we will have more in the future. So make sure that you are set to receive those when they come out. All right. Thanks, Chris. Uh, yeah. So I'll launch into uh, some of the factors that landlords commonly uh, use uh, when selecting tenants. And yeah, you know, some of these are obvious, but um, it's good to have a, uh, gone through intentionally, like Chris said, and, and decided how you're going to choose your tenants and what you want them to live up to. So one very ob obvious tenants need to have a, a source of income. So employment status is top of the list. And especially now with more gig employment and contractors, you need to decide wh whether you're going to require uh, a W-2 or some kind of employer documentation of income that could limit you to somebody who has just a W-2, you know, who is an employee, but, uh, you know, I don't think that'd be wise to do that. Um, so just know when it comes down to it, what you're going to ask for in terms of documentation. Some people are self-employed or contractors or have other maybe even rental income. I look for tenants who have at least three years of employment history and that I can verify. And then in terms of the amount of income, many landlords choose a three to one ratio of gross income to what the monthly rent amount is. We use a, a debt to income ratio, which could be debt of not more than 20% of a, a, an applicant's income. And, that, and that's a debt burden. That's the, the payments on the debt being not more than 20% of an applicant's income. So, and you can set these, yeah. these standards and these ratios to whatever you, know, you think fits best in your location, but those seem to work for us here and we've been using that for a long time. Yep. Yep. I use, mine's a little subjective. It's two and a half times the monthly rent after any big payments. So if there's a big car payment or student loan payment, I would kind of knock that off of the, the gross income amount. Okay. It's a bit crude, but you know, it's essentially it's about the three to one ratio that a lot of people use. And so, as long as long as you're applying that to everybody that comes through, right? Exactly. Exactly. Yep. I actually send that out in my pre-screening messages. I say I I ask them whether or not they have that level of income. And I send that to everybody. So and then as I touched on before, income documentation can come in the form of W-2 pay stubs. I've seen more than a couple of job offer letters for people who are moving to, into town and, and are coming to a new job. And sometimes when they're you know, independently employed, bank statements or profit and loss statements, you have to be also. So. Previous year, 1099s, things like that also work, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then you'll also want to, when you do your tenant screening, you're going to want to get their credit history. So you need to think about what standards you're going to apply there. Generally, for for some of the places that I manage, I have a minimum credit score of 620. I know that Eli, you talk about 650 is a good standard as well. So again, yeah. it's going to depend on on you know your situation and where you are and the type of um, environment that you're currently renting in. But generally, in, for us, in that 620 650 range, along with no current delinquencies, no more than three late payments to any of their creditors in the last three years. So you'll get all that. You'll see that in you know tenant screening reports, which we'll talk about in another episode, but mm -hmm. yeah, you'll see all that. So you're going to want to come up with what those requirements are up front. Um, criminal background, if you can look at it, that's one thing that you might consider, whether you're going to allow someone with you know criminal history or not. In places like Seattle, we're not allowed to, to look at a criminal background report. So it's not even something that we really consider, though you can look at sex offender status. And so again, think about what limitations you would be looking at. Eviction history, I think it's probably a good idea not to allow anyone that has had an eviction history unless it was a long time ago. And then bankruptcies. Um, again, we don't allow or we don't accept applicants with a bankruptcy unless it's been, you know, a long time, like seven years. And I think it just gets wiped clean from their record at that point. All right. Yeah. 
So when you're setting up these criteria, and we should point out that here in Seattle, we're required to, and in other places, to document what the selection criteria are and to include that in advertising. So it's necessarily you know, written down in our case. Uh, but what we're advocating here is that you is that you do that and pay special attention that when you're doing this, that you're not violating any laws, yeah, people's civil rights in particular. So first and foremost, make sure you're not choosing or denying applicants in violation of HUD's Fair Housing Act. And that protects people from seven classes. And those are based uh, any kind of discrimination based on race, color, national origin, sex, including gender identity and sexual orientation. Uh, familial status, which means, you know, do you have kids or dependents and possibly living with, you know, multiple generations and based on any disability. So those are the seven protected classes under HUD's Fair Housing Act. Also make sure you know your local laws. An example might be minimum occupancy. You may not be able to say only one person uh, like may live here, you know, in, in, in Seattle, again, uh, we have lots of rules, but you have to allow people to have roommates. So you just know what those are, know, and here again, know that you can't look at criminal background, you know, and so don't step on those rules because you can get in real trouble. So, yeah. And then make sure it's legal. That's kind of an aside, you know, back to the criteria that we use, many landlords use. You're also going to want to make sure that any applicant is able to verify their identity. So the nice thing about a lot of the property management software products now is that they, by default, I use TurboTenant. Um, but they, by default, request an image of a government-issued photo ID. So you're going to want to make sure you've seen that person and you've seen their ID. And I can't rent to somebody if you don't know that's who they, they are. Yeah. I would advocate requiring that you be able to verify past rental history. So I generally ask for three years of rental history. And I check references and I want to be able to get a hold of at least one and usually two past rental references. So. You want to just make sure that you're doing your due diligence. Yep, exactly. And, uh, you know, sticking to, to rental references, again, like you said, we're going to want to be able to reach them, you know, to be able to ask questions. And we've got a sample reference question document on our site that you can download. And it kind of goes through certain things that we think is a good idea to ask. And I use that checklist myself as well. So every time I get on the phone with a or send an email to a previous landlord or employer. So it's a good thing to have, you know, Take a look at that, download it, and you can use that. Um, smoking, you're going to decide what your rules are around smoking. Personally, I specify that no one who lives at the property can smoke or vape any substance in any form, basically, whether they do that inside or if it's outside, you know, I'd specify they need to be certain distance away from the property or out in the driveway or something like that. So just to not, you know, be standing in front of someone else's apartment or something like that. So think about how that works best for your property, but then specify that. I, I specify that I don't accept applicants who smoke or vape in any form anywhere. At, just because I don't want those rules to be bent or people with smoky clothes, even if they do follow the rule, I'm fussy about, about smoke. I, I'm specific, even actually in the pre-screening, I say, you know, whether it's on, on site or not, does anybody smoke? Right. Any, so. Yeah. So again, you know, that's something that you need to decide for yourself and what works best for you and kind of whether that limits the number of tenants that you're, you know, applicants or not, you know, it might not. So you know, it's something to consider. And then lastly, one thing to consider is whether you will accept co-signers or guarantors in your property. I think a lot of applicants, they might not qualify by themselves. I think especially around, you know, some of the properties that I manage, if I get a lot of students or college grads or grad students, and they might not have that employment income or the history or rental history or credit score. So consider whether you'll accept a co-signer or guarantor. That's someone who then is going to be responsible for the property at the end of the day. They're going to be on the hook uh, along with the renter if any payments are missed or any damage is done. So in my case, I will accept them and I, you know, treat them as if they are going to be an applicant for the property. I have them fill out an application and submit screening reports just as if they were a tenant and they got to meet the same selection criteria that the tenants do. So that's, you know, one thing to consider. There's different ways to go about it. It's always good to have a guarantor or a co-signer that's in state just so that you can reach them if needed. And, you know, they can be not too far and, and still kind of legally liable, but there's different documentation and different, you know, depending on where you are, different addenda that you might have to fill out when you accept a, a guarantor or co-signer. So just to make sure you've got the appropriate thing to make it legally binding. Right, right. 
So that's our list of the most common uh, criteria that we and a lot of landlords use to select tenants. We, and we have like, a sample selection criteria checklist on our site as well. Oh, that's right. Yeah, we'll uh, we'll link to that. Yeah, yeah. So our takeaway is that you know the trick to setting these rental criteria is making some decisions about what factors will actually help you choose applicants that will, in fact, really become good tenants. And while at the same time, not making your standards so strict or arbitrary that no one will actually qualify or even bother ap applying. So, you know, I, often even people who have had financial trouble, for example, in the past end up being great, reliable tenants, you know, divorce or other types of hardship can derail people temporarily who then can get back on their feet. You know, it's not cut and dry. Right. Yeah. And conversely, lots of applicants with poor rental histories or, or bad credit scores often have various reasons or excuses as well. And, you know, I'm can be a sucker for a good story. So, you know, having this kind of preset criteria can help you avoid falling for that. Because, you know, when it comes to that, that story, you know, it can sound good, but you don't really know what the truth is. So having that, that checklist kind of can make it cut and dry. I, I recently had a family who was mo moving uh, from overseas for a great a job opportunity, but had no uh, rental history, no credit, no references. No, you know, that fortunately they did have a professional relationship, and that person, you know, a local person, agreed to be a guarantor. So that when it comes down to it, setting rental criteria, you know, can help you be clear about what you feel is important. But sometimes you have to negotiate things, and basically, you know, just having the criteria list in hand, you have a roadmap. You don't have to follow it by the letter, but there are some pitfalls, you know, in a place like Seattle, for example, we have a first in time rule where the first person who applies, who meets all your criteria is who you need to accept. So the, the trick there is even making exceptions for people for worthy reasons, kind reasons, you have to be, you do have to be a little careful about that because if you can be shown to be inconsistent, then there could be trouble down the road, even if it's not really, you know, even if you haven't really wronged somebody, if they feel like it and they can show that you're not consistent with your criteria, there's some risk there. Yeah. Yeah. You, you know, they want to basically try and practice that same selection process to everybody so that it is fair. A, a good roadmap, carefully applied with, you know, probably some, some wiggle room where it makes sense is, you know, in practice what I do. Yeah. And when in doubt, talk to a lawyer. <laughs> yeah, I, I hate that we have to say that every time, all the time. <laughs> yeah. we do. So, okay. Well, that's what we got for you on rental criteria for selecting tenants. And uh, we hope that, that you've enjoyed this and that you'll like, share, and uh, subscribe so that you, you get future uh, installments, messages when we put out our, our next uh, episodes. And uh, appreciate you being here. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Thanks.